It's happy hour again from Uptown New Orleans. Hello, I'm Grant Morris. Happy hour as part of the family of shows on the podcast network. It's neworleans.com. When you walk into a bar in New Orleans and you pull up a bar stool, you can keep going under this if you like. Yeah, fine. Uh, you never know who's going to be sitting next to you. What you do know is no matter what they look like, what they're wearing, whether they're just going to have a limousine or just going to have jail, they're going to be happy to talk to you because that's New Orleans and this is Happy Hour, a cocktail-fueled 60 minutes of random conversation with folks who have nothing in common. Other than we're all New Millennials in a bar today, we're at the fabulous Wayfair on Ferret Street. And Wayfair, yes, it's still summer here in New Orleans. It's the endless summer, the summer that will never end. So you can still come down here for happy hour and get not your mama's frosé, the perfect summer drink, frozen cocktail made with dry rosé, vodka, St. Germain, Peixot's bitters, lemon juice, and a house-made strawberry basil syrup. And they have a three-hour happy hour here every day at Wayfair, which is a couple of blocks down from Napoleon Avenue on uh, Ferret Street. Josh Sarkman is playing the uh, theme song today. What is it called, Josh? It's, uh, it's called the David Torkanowski Radio Hour theme song. Okay. <laughs> Does David Torkanowski own the copyright to this? I don't the, know. <laughs> we're going to find chords. out. We're <laughs> yeah. going to find out. It's, I love it, though, and I love It's David nice. Torkanowski. Yeah. He won't mind if we just <laughs> use his stuff, really, I don't yeah. think. And Josh is here today with, with Surreal M.A. Surreal, it's so nice to meet you and to have you here. Nice to meet you, Grant. Once in a while, we inadvertently have sort of like a superstar happy hour here without intending to. <laughs> I have no idea what you're doing living in New Orleans, but I'm so excited that you are here. I'm excited to be living here. How long have you been here? Two years. Two years already? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, that's gone quickly. Yeah. In case nobody knows who you are, do a lot of people know who you are? Are you famous here? Here? Yeah. I mean, I'm jazz famous. Jazz famous, <laughs> right. That's, I don't know if people know how famous you are. This is what the Wall Street Journal said, that you were one of the most promising jazz singers of, of her generation. Wow. And the New York Times called you a rising star in the galaxy of jazz singers. The galaxy. The galaxy. <laughs> the universe. So it's pretty amazing that you are here. We'll get on to what, why did you move here exactly? Uh, a big part of it is Josh, actually. Really? You're yeah. in love with Josh? No. No. No, it's not romantic. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Oh, well, that's sisterly. Um, I came, I came, uh, visited New Orleans for the first time with some friends a, a few years ago, and we were here three days. And the person we were supposed to stay at had a last-minute gig, so they were like, "Oh, I'm so sorry." Um, I can't host you, but my friend Josh Starkman, he can probably host you. And so me and my two buddies, we stayed at Josh's house. He didn't know any of us. And for three days, he took us everywhere. He showed us everything in the city. He took us to morning call at 2 a.m. He took us to the singing tree. Uh, We sat in with him at Maison. And I was like, are people like you here? (laughs) <laughs> because if they are, I'm moving So that's moving what did And have you discovered that there are a lot of people like Josh, or is he the exception? He's an exception for sure. So but now you <laughs> realize you made a huge mistake. <laughs> no, I just I fell in love with the people here. People are so generous with their time and their their house and their their feelings. Their it's, I was living in New York before this, so it's right. a big difference. Well, thank God you're here. Yeah. Good. It's great to have you. Gia Hamilton is also here. Yes. Hi, Gia. Yeah. Hello. This is, the, this is the rest of the Superstar Day. Gia is the executive director and chief curator of the New Orleans African American Museum. Ooh. That's right. Among other things. Newly reopened. Yeah. As of April this year. Just April this year, 2019. Yes. And what was it doing before then? It was wrecked by Hurricane Katrina, it basically. It was sitting for six years, almost three acres of property in the middle of Treme, historic Treme. So right. You know how buildings do here, right? The the environment and the elements begin to take over the building. So we uh, started the renovation process in January and reopened one of our buildings in April. So it's been really exciting. That's very un-New Orleans-like, completely. Very un-New Orleans-like, exactly. Wasn't the same guys that were building the Hard Rock Hotel, did it? No, thank goodness. <laughs> it is just as well. Oh, hey Shout out to <laughs> Restoration Legacy, yeah. who is our contractor. Really fantastic guys. That's yeah. what we need. We need Restoration Legacy down on Canal we Street about now. We do. We do. So that's an exciting thing that you've got that museum back in. Because it was, it was like a sort of the heartbeat of Treme for a long time. There, there was Absolutely. all kinds of stuff going on there, music and shows, and people had weddings there. 
lots and lots of weddings, How like, you doing like that many again? of those spaces do. But you know, I think one of the things that's super exciting about the space is that it was actually the city's first brickyard, um, and so hmm. it, it sits along a path, the 5,000-year-old Chitimacha path, that uh, essentially was a trading path from the river to the lake. Um, and so the women would actually go all the way to Lake Pontchartrain to get silt and soil and bring it back and make bricks um, on that plantation. And then the men were the brick layer. So there's a lot of history just like wow. on that property. There is. Wow. Yeah. Because the building is not made of brick, actually, is it? It it's is wood. not. It is a traditional How weird sort is of. That? Yeah, like Creole villa. Right. The Villa Malor. Wouldn't you think they would make a house out of brick if they were building it in a brickyard? I, that makes sense to me. I am not sure why they decided the barge board. The ba right. barge board, though, is, does well with our weather. It's wood, Have right? you guys noticed right. what Gia's carrying around here today? A child. <laughs> I asked, what is that? Is that a baby? <laughs> Because I'm stupid. <laughs> There's a little pouch here, and I'm, I take my four-month-old with me everywhere, including the museum. Well, so. you would have to. What else can you do with a four-month-old? You know, people do I guess someone else could look after him, I suppose. But <laughs> how's he doing? He's doing well. He's he's a New Orleans African American Museum baby. So is he, he enjoying the podcast so far? Do you he think? is sleeping. This is uh, not his first podcast. Hopefully, yeah. no bored. indication of uh, you know the excitement <laughs> of the podcast. All right. But, yeah. And I see you're wearing it's an ordinary outfit today. I was in, interested to see what you're going to wear today. This is true. I do love my vintage clothes you and crazy got outfits. Such amazing clothes. <laughs> I've been watching your video blog. Things called this. what is it? Live artfully, or live yes, live your purpose artfully. Live your purpose artfully. Yes. And every time, every episode is you in another fabulous costume. Is it real? I yes. appreciate Have hearing a look. that. I love Ta that. Take a look. Yeah. I like I like colors. I like uh, interviewing colorful people. So the the idea is to interview folks who are really right. just trying to find their passion, and are blending things that are kind of uncommon, you know, and and putting them together in a life that works for them. So kind of like happy hour. Kind of like happy hour. Josh does a daily show as yeah. well. We're going to get to that in a minute because first I want to introduce you to Matt Wisdom is here. Matt Matt is the CEO of Turbo Squid. Hello, Grant. Hello, Matt. It's good to see you again. I haven't seen you since 2012 or something. I looked up the, the record. The days are short. Or the <laughs> days are long. The years yeah. are short. Is that it? It's is that what it is? Years. And and does anybody? Do you guys know what Turbo Squid is? Josh, you got any idea? Is it like one of those um, three guesses. electrical <laughs> plug things that are like uh, it's like tentacles instead of a strip? One. Okay. <laughs> Do you know what Turbo Squid is? Is it like a, a stuffed animal that has, you know, <laughs> some batteries included and it... It's awesome. That's close. <laughs> it's close. It's That's very close. That's the other business model we yeah. considered, but no. It's nice. Matt will tell you what it is. Well, it's kind of like a, a marketplace for people buying computer graphics. So it's like an Amazon or an eBay, people buying computer graphics around the world. You've seen our um. stuff from all, all kinds of movies and games and... I, Variety of places. According to my information, it's the world's leading seller of 3D models used to create imagery in feature films, computer games, VR, and other industries. Wow, that, that's a fact. world's leading. Wow. By world, what? we mean the entire planet Earth. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you're the biggest guy on Earth in the VR 3D model. World. It's like a relatively small industry, probably smaller than knitting, but in it were <laughs> rock stars. You wouldn't believe. Like, I, I go to conferences, I actually had people selfie with me in this tiny little industry. So that's like so my very small minutes of fame other than so being your, on this podcast. So your, what is it called? Is it called 3D modeling? Yeah, they're 3D models. So they're you're 3D model famous and <laughs> MA is jazz famous. <laughs> Jazz famous, I think three. Yeah. Jazz famous is better than three. I mean, jazz famous, famous is even. <laughs> such jazz is the smallest sort of musical genre there is, I think, probably. Yeah, it's so small, it's, so mighty. Is it smaller than small classical? Small and mighty. Small it's not the size that counts, Grant. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but is jazz smaller than classical, even, or is classical smaller than jazz? Uh, we'll just say classical smaller. I would say. Yeah, so back. where's where's no where's 3D modeling compared to classical and jazz? You think it's even smaller than all that, or is it bigger? God, you know, I, I, I think it's growing. It's in its ascendancy. You know, right. we've got virtual reality and augmented reality. We're, right. we're, we're moving. So, so you're the I'm Jeff, hoping you're we're, we're going to intersect Bezos. at some point. You're the Jeff Bezos of 3D model. I, you're the biggest I, I like online that. that's, that's, in the thing in the world. It's a marketplace, right? It's I, like you Amazon. said it. I'll, I'm happy to adopt Jeff that. Jeff Bezos I, of 3D I'm model. I'm praying somebody will write my Wikipedia page one day and they'll quote you. Do you have a Wikipedia page? No. You I don't. Want, Why I don't you write, can write one? Somebody has to write it honestly. I'd never Why write would, my own. You know, I don't honestly, think you're allowed to. People, no, I, people don't write Wikipedia pages <laughs> honestly. I know, but <laughs> just saying. Do you have a Wikipedia page, Josh? Oh, one day. 
You don't have one yet? You, you hire a PR firm. That's what the best That's how you get one? Yeah. Emma, you have a Wikipedia page, right? I do, but I didn't write it. I don't think you're allowed uh, to write uh, your own uh, Wikipedia page. No, how do they verify if it's you writing it or not? Good question. Gia, do you know that? I mean, the info is correct. It is? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Matt, how come you don't have one if you're the biggest guy in the whole world in this well, I, you industry? Know, I'm working on it. I'm so working do you on ever it. not have a PR company? Well, you could. I'm just, there's one do for you? the company. I just right. don't feel like self-promoting like that. I don't know. But people already take selfies with you. You should capitalize on yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I can be your guy. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk afterwards. Okay, you can well, you play a guitar company. as well, right? Yeah. Okay, so you could be on Josh's show. I'll trade lessons yeah. <laughs> or anything. For, for Wikipedia for writing. Yeah. yeah. He so all I need Josh, is more talent. Josh has a daily video show yes. that he makes, which is... It's called Have a Great Day. Yeah, that's a thing. It's really... Have you seen this, Gia? I have not. Now, I want to have a great day. Yeah. So this is a way... Answer. This is a good place to start. <laughs> I, I document and I promote uh, musicians and artists or whoever wants to be on a camera playing music with me. Awesome. And I have a good time. It's amazing. Every <laughs> single day, there's someone else who's an amazing musician playing with Josh, who's also an amazing musician, isn't he, Cyril? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you have to say that? Well, I have to say that I hire him, so that means a lot. Yeah, there you Aww. go. <laughs> oh, he's got chops. Make he's mistake. really good. Oh, Matt, yeah. Matt, when did you start playing? High school. I just what high school was it? It was Country Day. Country New Day, mm -hmm. okay. New Orleans, what high school? Ooh. Uh, no, That's how we no. do it here. <laughs> That's how we do it. You went to school here. Aren't I, you from here, too? I am from here. Five what generations. School? Five generations. <laughs> what school did you go to? I went to McMain. Go Mustangs. <laughs> okay. McMain Magnet. That's correct. Was it a big deal school then? Did you have to test in at you those You had tests? to test in, yeah. So everyone's super smart here. <laughs> we would like to think so. And what did you do after school? I, uh, honestly, I got the hell out of here. Nice. Uh, New Orleans was small, <laughs> so I left uh, yeah. and, w and went to New York City and attempted a life there for 15 years. Wow. So it's my second home. Okay. And, yeah. But you pulled off quite a bit including having four kids. I did. I did. I mean, you know, I was there. Uh, my parents loved the fact that I finished from NYU and decided to become a farmer. That was their most favorite moment, I think. Uh, wow. Well, were you growing weed back then? <laughs> I wish. I wish. What were you growing? No, we, we had a small little farm uh, near Ithaca um, afterwards. I was really disenchanted with um, the corporate world and left to kind of uh, live off the land. Who's, it was very Denise weed? Huxtable. My, my husband and I. <laughs> so you got your husband to go along with us, or this did he drag you out? You know, New Orleans women are very persuasive, so yes. <laughs> so you, you met this guy in New York? Here in New Orleans. Here. And you dragged him to New York, and then you dragged him to become a farmer. That's correct. Wow. Loyal. Yes. Loyal. <laughs> yeah. Ride or die. Ride, Ride or die, die guy. <laughs> yes. And how Ride long did you track. stick it out on the farm? What were you growing there? <laughs> We were growing everything, mostly microgreens um, and medicinal herbs, uh, which wow. I later brought back that practice back to New Orleans um, years later. And we had a little small uh, business called Grigri Lab, where we grew medicinal herbs and sold them to farms um, in the city. To farms or pharmacies? Farms. You sold. So Medicinal Grove herbs farm? to farms. Yeah. What the heck does that? How do you do that? That that just that just meant that we we grew them and then we would sell them in bulk. So we dry them. We'd make tinctures or syrups. Why and would we'd a farm them. be growing? Why would a farm be <laughs> buying dried vegetables? So they were a, co a cooperative. So they were really interested in how they could promote smaller farmers, right? And so they acted really as that like third party place right. that Holly people Grove, could come. Holly Grove Market. Right. Yep, which is closed now, yeah. unfortunately. Well, Grigri Labs, how did they pronounce that in New York? I mean, did they call it like Gris Gris Labs? Gris Gris Labs. It was Gris Gris Labs. Constantly. Oh. It was really frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, that keep... is a good marketing question. That's a pretty bad name. <laughs> We'd always put it in parentheses, right? The phonetic spelling so that people could pronounce it correctly. It never worked. Well, how did all. you get into becoming, uh, doing what you're doing now then? Being a you director know, of a... And it's, it's, it's funny. I've had a winding path, um, always sort of four intersections in my work, in my life. Um, I love growing. Uh, so food, work has always been a part of my life. Um, art, my mother's a writer, and so art has always been a part of my life. Music, my grandfather was a jazz musician. Um, what did he do here he in New Orleans? He was yes. a jazz pianist. Charlie Skates Hamilton played with Preservation Hall. He played with George oh. Lewis. Oh, cool. Yeah, so... Um, music was always a part of our lives, art and theater and, and writing. Um, and then we had that, that weird scientist father, so I had to go to school. And, you know. you had a, your father was a weird scientist? 
<laughs> or was weird he a scientist. Or was he a weird person? I hope he's not listening. Maybe, maybe he'll Is listen. he still here? He is still here. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, he's probably listening. He's did, you, did you have to get an engineering degree and an, a liberal arts degree? How did that go? He tried. He, he tried. tried. He is now trying with his grandchildren. <laughs> okay, so you have four kids, and this is number five. This is number five. Little Zaire. Little Zaire. So your oldest one is... 18. 18 years old. Whoa. So you've been a mom for a long time, and it's, you've got a long way to go. I have. Still. I have. You, 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 you know, people ask all the time, like, so, you know, it's, it's easy now, right? And you know all the things. And I'm like, no, actually, it's, it's, it's not. Worse. Now it's you're the old. most humbling job Every that you don't get paid right? for. Every yeah. kid's different. Yeah, yeah right. absolutely. Did you think you were out of the woods when you last kid turned, like turned 15 or 16? I was 16, like, I'm out of the woods. I'll have my then, freedom. Yeah. No. No, you never no. thought that was. I always wanted a big family. Yeah. I never, I never. So this is the last one or not the last this one? This is probably the not last person. Not necessarily, But though. not necessarily. Okay. All right. But probably. Matt and I were actually talking about that. You wanted 10 children. Is that right? Did you? <laughs> yeah. Then I had one, and then I decided <laughs> I wanted five, and then I had two, and then I was more or less done. Yeah. And then there was a third, yeah. and I love him dearly. All right. So you negotiated yourself down from 10 to 3. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Reality negotiated me into a So how place. are your kids? They're 20, 18, and 16. Wow, you guys look awfully young for yeah. people. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Did Facebook Live get this? How young yeah. we look? Um, don't right? they, don't oh. they look young? <laughs> Yeah, yes. I mean, for having 17 kids each, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And if you could add a filter or two, that would be great. Right. I've we learned like the smuggling. magic of this thing, and not the one that ages you <laughs> prematurely. but make The one with the little good. pussycat ears? That, oh. We have that one. <laughs> that yeah. one, that one. Hey, so surreal. So you moved here to New Orleans to, to sing or to write or? To chill. To get mm. out of? being famous or what? No, because I was living in New York for 10 years. And you lived for 10 years? Wow. Mm -hmm. And at first when I moved to New York, it was because I wanted to be part of the scene and to learn and to, to play in the clubs and everything. And I did that for a while, but in the last few years, I wasn't really playing in New York as often because when I would play in New York, I was playing a, a more higher, bigger room where they you can't really play uh, months before because they want to sell tickets in that, that show. So I had exclusivity contracts. So I wasn't really playing in New York anymore. And so, so the more famous you got, the less you played? Well, I would go and play on the road. Right. So I, I tour a lot. And so, you know, when you're touring a lot and you're running and always going from point A to point B, when I was home, which meant I was uh, off, I was in the busiest, fast-paced city <laughs> right. ever. Very relaxing. So there was not really a, a, a downtime. So I came to New Orleans so that while I'm not touring, I'm in a place where it's slower and uh, the quality of life is, is, is higher and, and I have time to do you know, things and also to be outside. I like I liked the warmth and the food here. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> right. So you found the right place. So you're staying? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All I right. bought a house here. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're not like these other famous people like Brad Pitt and all these guys. Didn't he buy a bunch of houses here? He bought, he bought a house. He built a lot of houses here, but that was for other people. Yeah. But they're Cage. weird looking. Nicholas Cage, Cage was here for a while. Nicholas Cage is my neighbor. Really? Really? Yeah. All right. How'd that, that go? Thing. Uh, you know, well, I, he didn't remember where his cross street was, or actually, his, his wife did. It was interesting. They, he couldn't they remember had a where he here, lived. They, uh, they had a house in the Garden District and one in the French Quarter, and they sort of, that was a problem that came up a couple times in their relationship. Couldn't, couldn't remember which house. house they lived in. <laughs> wow. That's a good problem. He bought Daniel Lanois' old house on Esplanade Avenue. He bought that one, too. He bought the haunted house, the, the one that's like the seriously haunted house in downtown. He said he liked to buy ghost front property. Ghost so front. he bought a chapel oh, on 3rd and Britannia. <laughs> that was his quote. Come on, bro. And he bought the one that's like the, the what is it? I, I can't remember the name of the, the house, but in the quarter, that's like the right. most haunted of all haunted houses oh, in really? New Orleans. Yeah. So did you see him around when he was here? Were you, did you hang I out? His, I saw his wife. It was just fascinating. His wife, because it took a little while to figure this out, because my, my at some point, my, my youngest, who at that time was like six, said, Dad, I'm friends with the the son of the rock star who lives next door. And I was like, oh, wait, hold on. I can Wikipedia this. Like, you can find out who Nick Cage's son's name is. So 
I said, what's his name? And he said, it's Kalal. And it turns out, yes, his name is Kal L, which is the Superman's name on planet Krypton. The son and of Nicolas Cage. Is Kal L. Yeah, yeah. And he's named after <laughs> Superman on Krypton. So that's it. Okay. So it's all, you could val validate stuff. So his anyway. tomb is really impressive, too, here as well. It's like a pyramid or something. You already hey, bought Nicholas a plot. Cage, he's not yeah, dead. in right? St. Louis. No, he wishes he was, maybe. He bought a plot for himself? <laughs> yeah, yeah, in St. Louis Cemetery. I think. Thinking ahead. Yeah, what? thinking ahead. Seriously? Are you serious? Yeah. You can it's go very to, romantic. You can go to Nicolas Cage's grave? Yeah. So, well, <laughs> hopefully not soon to be. I mean, yeah. he's got a lot of work yeah. left. The death date is a question. second time I've heard this in a month. <laughs> is that right, Thomas? Yeah. Somebody else has brought this up to yeah. me, wow. too. It's important New Orleans knowledge. Yet. That's good stuff, Joshua. Yeah. How do you know that? I'm, I'm, I'm just a learned man. You apparently know <laughs> stuff. He's a great New Orleans tour guide. He yeah. must be. Did he I, take you to Nicolas Cage's tour? No, how dare you. I'm sorry. We'll get around to it. That'll be correct. on the ghost store sooner or later. Well, what happened to him? So he lost a whole lot of money and had to sell everything, I think. Is that right? Yeah, the, I think the IRS got a hold of him. Oh. So that's what, yeah, we well, have to pay taxes at some point. So Carl L is gone as well, the whole, and the wife, is he still married to Mrs. Cage? Uh, I, I, you know, Alice, is, she's wonderful, but um, I, I can't speak to their marriage. I'm not don't really know. sure. You don't know anything. You haven't kept up with them, the Cage. Well, they had a little bit of a run-in on, the, there was a whole thing in the French Quarter. It was sort of, that was the last I heard. That, he was going to the wrong house, and he got arrested, and there was a whole thing. It was, it was a little oh, really? bit rough. Yeah, yeah. It was big news. He was so high or drunk that he walked into the wrong house. See, he happened to be at the restaurant Stella, you know, while it was there, and then uh, as he had a whole scene, and then unfortunately the editor of Vanity Fair was there too, and so nice. wrote a whole article about what happened as he melted down wow. in the restaurant. And then after that, he left, couldn't find his house, and then was like arrested, and it was, anyway. I don't it remember just, any of this. you remember any of this, you guys? Actors can't stop acting. Right. That's right. <laughs> they wow. can't. That is a crazy story. <laughs> oh, it, so who bought the house now, the next day, the neighbors? Um, who are current uh, neighbors? You know, med mal plaintiffs. You know, Just plaintiffs attorneys. <laughs> you know, regular folks. The, the pe people, successful folks who okay. end up coming in. You know, Where do you live special house. now that you're the world's biggest? Oh, God. Well, you know, I Project actually just, I just sold the house and moved from the Garden District to Uptown. Okay. So it's fun. So it's a, a nice little change of pace. All right. I wanted to be what in What made the you move? You want, you want, do you want a bigger place or a smaller place? Or I want a smaller place. It's hard to run one of these battleships in the in the Garden District. It's an old, fun house. It's a house they shot this movie Django Unchained in for okay. a while. So we had all the, it was Wait, a ton a of fun. Oh. oh my goodness, you gave up the pool? <laughs> so what happened? You, you know, made a huge bunch of money there when you started the business and you bought a giant house in the Garden District and then and then I didn't learned turn my lesson and such then, a great well, idea. You know, right. it's a lot of yeah. it's a lot of fun, but there's a thing called too much house. And when your kids are moving out of the house and you're sort of sitting around saying there's right. a time. So I'm learning, I'm downsizing in my late 40s, and, and, and I'm enjoying it. Except for, you know, moving to the new place this week, uh, the air conditioning breaks, and there's a boil advisory. I'm just like, I'm drinking the water. I'm drinking the ice. <laughs> I'm yeah, the ice. I, I never I'm pay done. attention to that boil water advisory. Did you, do you care about that? No. I don't worry about that. Hey, listen, you guys, you want to play something surreal while we're sitting here with a guitar? Yeah. What do you want to play? What do you want to do? Okay. I'm going to take the headphones off. Okay. Marry me a little. Love me just enough. Cry, but not too often. Play, but not too rough. Keep a tender distance. So we'll both be free, that's the way it ought to be. I'm ready, marry me a little, do it with a will. Make a few demands I'm able to fulfill. Want me more than others, not exclusively, that's the way it ought to be. I'm ready, I'm ready now. You can be my best friend I can be your right arm We'll go through a fight or two No harm, no harm We'll build a cocoon Of love and respect You'll promise 
it whatever you like I'll never collect right okay then I'm ready I'm ready now marry me a little love me just enough warm and sweet and easy just the simple stuff Keep a tender distance so we'll both be free. That's the way it ought to be. I'm ready, marry me a little, body, heart, and soul. Passionate as hell, but always in control. Want me first and foremost, keep me company. That's the way it ought to be. I'm ready, I'm ready now. Gently we'll talk. Oh, how softly we'll tread. All the stings, the ugly things we'll keep unsaid. We'll build a cocoon of love and respect. You promise whatever you like, I'll never collect, right? Okay then, I'm ready, I'm ready now, someone, I'm ready. Okay, what do you, you what do you think of that, kids? Yeah, that was lovely. That's a pretty a great voice. rare that's treat. That was that, Sondheim. That's off your yeah. album called Move On. Yes, it's a it's a the album is a tribute to Stephen Sondheim, who's a legendary Broadway composer. He he wrote the lyrics to West Side Story when he was 26, and he's now 89 or something. And this song is from a show called Company which is um, the main character, Bobby, is the only single person in his whole entourage, so all his friends are in a relationship or they're getting married or they, they've been married several times, they have kids, and they're all telling him, Bobby, you have to find a nice girl and settle down. And, you know, telling him, it's, a, it's hard work, but it's amazing. And, and Bobby, you know, he, they're all his friends, and he can see that it's not amazing. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, so he's kind of uh, struggling with the fear of commitment versus the longing for intimacy. And that this song is a song that he sings in the show, Marry Me a Little. That's kind of what everyone's struggling with, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Fear of commitment and a desire for intimacy. Yeah. We'd like to be married a little bit, not exclusively, too. So that's a, that's know, a sort of a dream. Uh, yeah, it's very forward-looking, I think. <laughs> and do you are you acting as well, um, or are you just singing these Sondheim Broadway songs? Oh yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm I'm a singer, but I believe in the songs I sing, and I live them while I'm singing right. them. So maybe. Visually, it looks like I'm acting, but... <laughs> now, I mean, do you want to get on stage and sing these songs in the show, or oh, are you happy? Oh, I would like that. That would be fun. Because you know Stephen Sondheim, right? Yeah, um, I do. So, is he powerful enough still in Broadway to tell people who to cast in the show? I mean, I don't know. We're not buddies or anything. But he's a big <laughs> fan of yours, though. Yeah, um, I actually, the way I, I discovered his music was because I got casted to do a, a tribute to Sondheim show at the New York City Center with the Winter Marsalis Orchestra. And, uh, and I was on stage acting these songs, and the two female singers of the show were myself and Bernadette Peters. <laughs> and that was my introduction to his music. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty star-studded introduction. And did you meet him through that? Yes. Okay. Yes. He, he knocked on my door and told me I made him laugh and cry. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty, pretty amazing accolade. Yeah. But have you, are you interested? How would you go about 
transitioning from just being a singer, singing these songs on a record, to actually singing them on a Broadway stage? Well, the first thing is not to move from New York to New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> That would be a good step <laughs> and leave Broadway behind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm not actively looking for it, but if, if I get asked, because I'm mostly a musician and I ha already have so many goals as a musician, like, for example, writing music, uh, that I'm, I mean, I, after being part of that show, that Stephen Sondheim tribute, I was... a amongst a lot of actors and people from the Broadway world and it's so hard basically they spend their whole days going to auditions yeah. and they do dozens of auditions to maybe get one call back and it's I mean you have to dedicate your whole self to it and so I'm you're not going to just get cast magically by because Stephen Sondheim likes you you're not going to get exactly that's what happened to me see that's how yeah. I that's how I make things happen <laughs> right <laughs> But is there, there's not really any real way that could happen. Uh, Realistically, you have to audition for everything and you've got to dedicate your life to it. Yeah, if you want to be in the Broadway world, yeah. See, what you need is, you need a lifestyle coach. I thought uh, you needed a green green. I'm going to come back. <laughs> I'm going to tell you exactly how to get a lifestyle coach in just a minute. We're going to take a very quick break and we're going to come back and talk about your future on Broadway. Okay, Surreal? Okay, sounds good. Okay. <laughs> And we're back on Happy Hour with Matt Wisdom, Surreal M.A. Very long break. <laughs> Josh Starkman and Gia <laughs> Hamilton. And Gia Hamilton, I'm going to turn to you next and have you explain to Surreal how to achieve her life goals. You know, I had a feeling you were going to come to me about okay. that. Okay. <laughs> Lifestyle coaching is pretty, is, is I think simple in its design, which is really to get to know a person that you're working with, understand their goals and help them achieve their goals. And I, I, I'm guessing there's a reason you're I've directing got, that question see, to me. I am directing it to you because I have here <laughs> in my notes that Graham DePonte, our producer, gave me. It says that you are a lifestyle coach. The, it says is, that I could schedule a rapid strategy session with you. This is work that I have done. Um, so my practice um, from farming led to sort of a healing practice. So um, a massage therapy, acupuncture practice, um, and then working with people. So working with them in terms of their like body, their uh, kind of life goals and purpose, and helping them to kind of understand how to shape those goals so that they can actualize them. So kind of using a total holistic approach to that. Does it work? It, it sometimes. What when, percentage of success would you have with a client? You know, it really depends, but it depends on the person's commitment and their belief in the thing that they want to achieve. Um, and so it really is kind of an intimate relationship with, uh, with a client, with the person that you're right. working with. Josh, you have a lifetime goal that you're trying to achieve? <laughs> a lifetime goal. A lot of different things, I guess. But it's interesting that you're talking about this because I come from a family of this. My dad's a chiropractor, and my brother's a massage therapist and acupuncturist. My mom was a midwife uh -huh. for 30 years. Yeah. So I've been around all this stuff. My brother actually is a life coach. There's something interesting about life coaches, though, is because it's like they... Uh, what, how do I put this? It's like... Uh, like they themselves need a life coach, but <laughs> they become a life coach because it's a, a good, it's good for them as well. You because know what I mean? it's true, it's true. Is it yeah. Therapists. yeah, therapists. It's like well. psychiatrists yeah. are all crazy. Yeah, it helps yeah. keep you accountable, honestly. Right. Yeah. Except uh, this is more organic, fair trade, local. Is that, <laughs> is that why you started doing it? Because your life was a mess yourself? Yeah, it's always a mess. <laughs> Five <what> kids, <laughs> you can't help but have a messy life. Uh, but you know what I have learned is like how you handle the messiness, how you handle the things that are that are troubling and, and challenging is, is kind of like where the magic lies. So now I work a lot with artists mm -hmm. um, and that work kind of translates seamlessly, right? Like artists are always kind of thinking about the industry. They're thinking about how to get, get in and break into the industry. And it's been really fun now helping artists to think about um, how to think about themselves as mini businesses and how to set goals for themselves and to kind of achieve a bit of sustainability so that they can continue to do the things they love. You've already got something going going for you as an artist if you're together enough to hire a lifestyle coach. <laughs> I was going to say, do you give a good discount for the artists? I mean, it's 
It's now hard I'm to doing starve this and hire a life coach. For I'm, free? For free. What? Because I work at a museum and I've worked at a residency. So I find that, like, when I'm not consulting folks who can really afford to have, like, you know, someone work with them, I, I just, I do this work because I love it. I want to see people um, live their best lives. And, you know, you get to do that as an administrator. But there's another component that really is about, like, listening to people, you know? And, and helping them and really um, giving them space to think about the things that they, you know, maybe don't give themselves permission to dream and, and think about. So that part is fun and it reminds me that it's also my job to do that for myself. Do you have any training in that or do you just make it up as you go? You, lots of people do make it up as they go, this is true. Um, I, you know, I do have training. Um, I'm, I'm an applied anthropologist, so I'm always looking at qualitative information and how that's useful both within organizations um, but also smaller groups. And then I've actually also taken courses. So again, my, my practice is really centered around food, healing, art, and kind of radical education. So it's, it's always combining those things in whatever projects I take on. Um, and as of late, the last 10 years, it's, it's been centered around real estate development, interestingly enough. So how do we, you know... How'd you fit that into you know, food, if healing, people don't art, and radical have, education? If people don't have space to actually um, have freedom to do some of the things that they're interested in doing, then, you know, they're, they're searching for the right spaces to actually be able to show work or perform or try something new. And so a lot of what I'm doing is trying to think about institution building differently um, and, and with, a, you know, a more inclusive sort of um, um, and, and equitable lens. So the last two projects that I've done really bring people into the fray where you get an opportunity to maybe try something and fail. And I think in maybe even failing or not doing something well, there's something really incredible that happens. That's all part of the process. You have to fail to succeed. Absolutely. That's a big entrepreneurial it, thing, isn't it, Matt? Yeah. Entrepreneurs used to always say that. Are they still saying that? Oh, it's, it's so painful because the thing <laughs> is you have all these great ideas and it's not your best idea that sort of survives and, and, and succeeds. Or what so, you think is the best. Oh, really? yeah, you had this yeah. idea and it turns out you're like, why this one? I mean, I had this idea and that idea. And I, you know. I remember a great idea you had. Which one? Vote it. Oh, God. Remember that? <laughs> yeah, I was trying to help I people love like, decide things all together, but it's hard to get people to pay money to have a platform sort of like hey, can, survey. Can you explain to these guys what vote it was? It was yeah. awesome. Well, imagine you could all like vote and you're trying to decide an issue and everybody's votes could change at the same time and you're writing comments about why you support something or don't like something. It was really interesting. It was a lot of fun. It just, but, but it turns out that if you're trying to democratize decision making, it turns out management won't pay for it. <laughs> the last thing, it turns out power, the last thing power wants to do is give up power and then pay to give up power. So it's so the wrong formulation for a business idea, although, you know, it was... It's still it a such run. a great idea. It was a piece of software that you could, everyone could log on to. It seems like someone like you, Gia, could use that, right? Yes. Maybe oh. you were just looking at the wrong place. You were looking to sell it to business, whereas you could sell it to some other nonprofit well, type. Work. Well, you never know. And, and somebody, you, somebody said to me, what do you want to be? Do you want to be more handsome or stronger? Or, or do you want to be richer or whatever it was? I, was like, I just want better timing. Because you have these ideas and you're like, you're early. And if you're early, people don't like your idea and it's sort of dead. And there are all right. these ideas that, you know, whatever, toys.com or pets.com, like all these failures that are now like people buy all their pet food online, whatever is going Amazon. on, right? Amazon.com just killed oh. all of it, though. And what's well, in Amazon? Well, I that's a good question. I want to right. ask you guys this question, especially you. And if you just brought this up, Josh, that is Amazon.com the bad guy or the good guy? Is it a marketplace where anybody can sell anything and it's democratized business, or has it killed everything? Like, is it the Walmart of online? Both? I think yeah, both. time will tell. Bezos wants to go to the moon, so when the robots <laughs> that develop there and take over come back here and kill all of us, we can make a, make a call. <laughs> but I'm serious. Is there an answer to this question? Is he a good guy, Jeff Bezos, or is he... They're driving prices down, and they're mercilessly driving prices down and driving convenience and stuff up. And so, like, I, have, I don't know if you've been to the Amazon Go store where you walk in, you just open your phone, it scans your code, there's no cashier. So you walk in and grab something off the shelf, put it down, walk to the next shelf, grab whatever you want, and you just walk out and you get a bill. It is magic to walk into a place where you, there's no cashier, you take what you want and you leave. I, like, I they're like cashiers. You really? You I like sitting in? You person, like queuing up? Maybe there's a person with a job, you know? Well, that's a different problem. Yeah, and, then also, and then also these places a lot of time are cashless. 
So you have, it's almost like class warfare in a way. If you don't have access to a bank account, then you're screwed. Well, yeah. that's true. Something like this, if you, yeah. You know, cash, huh? there's, there's an interesting project called the Venus Project that kind of looks at doing away with menial labor and like what that means for human potential. Huh. And so in a, in, a, in a really idealistic way, I feel like the move towards how we use our time, how we use our brain power and our capacity is actually kind of fascinating. Now the process to getting there, I don't think will be a smooth process. Um, if that's where humans are going, right? Uh, which is just like, hey, you know, what else could this cashier be doing with his or her time mm -hmm. if menial labor was taken care of? But if we democratized and, and, and made processes more equitable, right? I don't know that that can happen in a capitalist system. Right. Though, There's right? always a lot of losers. I've got two words. <laughs> yes, Matt, what is lots it? of losers. Lots. I was going to say, well, one of, the, <laughs> one of the people who loves New Orleans started this company called Venture for America, had all these people come to New Orleans, like, uh, like great, incredible graduates to help start in New Orleans and having a lot of success and he came here and he said he, he said hey Matt uh, what do you think about AI and what's about to happen to all the jobs in the world and I was like oh we're fucked we are <laughs> fucked it is unbelievable he said yeah that's why I'm running for president and so he's Andrew Yang Andrew he is a Yang huge fan of New Orleans and doing stuff here but it's like anyway so that message has carried him I think he's sixth in the polls he killed it in the debates last night but it's fascinating to watch a person who's just like one of us basically sit up there and just tell a lot of truth. It's wild to watch. Well, he's got the solution to this end of manual labor, which is this universal basic income where everybody gets a thousand bucks a month. Right. So and you're trying it and, and, and surveying people about how they spend that money. And it's, it's, it is fascinating, I think. Um, is it working? You know, working, I think, is, is the wrong way to, to, to kind of think about an analysis around it. I think um, it's been more fascinating to see people are using it for things like, you know, child care or trying to pay off bills. And then, of course, you have people who are sort of saying, you know, I'm going to treat myself to that nice dinner that I never get to do. And I feel like even though we might have a critique of that, I think that's also important, right? That people can see themselves outside of just sort of working to pay off debt. And yeah. so there's something for us to learn from this kind of experiment that's happening um, around universal income. I, you know, I worked with a lot of people who just did you work in the tech industry, Russian folks who'd grown up under the Soviet system. And they said,